What we discover is that uh, people doing women's history, identified as women's history, uh, face severe institutional discouragement. Incidentally, this isn't only about history. This is about virtually every field in the social sciences and humanities. Um, face severe institutional discouragement. That is, projects which deal with the psychology of women, projects which deal with the uh, politics of women are deemed too narrow by the departments in which they exist. And such people <coughs> are often punished in the way the academy can punish by slower promotion rates, slower merit increases, and so on. Uh, fellowships come to them more rarely, promotion, advancement, um, and so on, uh, come to them less well. There was one, there was one institute for the advanced uh, study of women, the Radcliffe Institute, which provided fellowships for women studying women uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, until the mid-1980s, after it was then called the Bunting Institute. It was then transformed into the Radcliffe Institute. And in addition to getting a whole bunch more money from Harvard and the whole of the Radcliffe Endowment, it became an institute for general advanced study. And now, you know, it's no, no longer has very much to do with gender or women of any kind anymore. And that's just one of those ways that, you know, the discouragement, you know, so. So whereas it used to be that you could say to yourself, ah, I'm studying women, and now there's this prestigious place I can go apply for a fellowship. There are no such prestigious places um, uh, anymore. Similarly, jobs disappear or are narrowly defined. Uh, within the academy, uh, you know, there are jobs in women's history. There are still a few around in every department has to have one women's historian, but once you're one women's historian, uh, I would argue that this delegitimization of the study of uh, women has pushed people into placing it uh, into, um, uh, uh, you know, well, let me say, it's pushed people into devaluing it as they search for what you might call traditional unifying systems or for unifying systems. So for example, just as the issue of diversity gets dismissed as identity politics, so women get identified with the identity politics. So gender, class, and race, you know, that's just a triptych. We don't pay attention to that anymore. You know, it's a trope that has no meaning. Uh, identity politics disunites America in the words of uh, Arthur Schlesinger. May he rest in peace. Um, yeah. May he rest in peace. And if you looked at the recent issue of the New York Review of Books, you saw a piece by Andy Dalbanco in which he decried diversity aims of universities, including uh, diversification around women, who are, after all, 51% of the population, as being divisive, as negating attention to the really serious issues of class and poverty, as pushing people who were concerned with those diversity issues, including women's issues, to focus on small questions. At the same time, this, um, you know, ide what I suppose I would call ideological repression uh, is naturalized. That is, it's made to seem as though it is normal. So, uh, you know, uh, the new trope fosters inclusionary uh, political frameworks in which, the, in which the key roles may be played by either men or women but in which one might actually be able to see women playing those roles if one pays attention to them. So, for example, in the early uh, 1970s, uh, we began to dig out the role of women in social policy, uh, the role of women in the abolition movement, the role of women, uh, religious women, and their influence on. And the emphasis there was on the roles that women played. We have now turned our attention to the 
<coughs> gain guilt, you know, the gendering of social policy to abolition as a movement that surely incorporates men and women, but in which we can no longer see or follow the influence of women. I see Ellen looking at me, so let me just bring this to what I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that uh, the, the repressive atmosphere around women's issues has pushed us into looking at these larger issues instead of examining them in terms of the particulars of how women exercise power through them to a larger sphere. We are now encouraged to look at the ways in which they too participate in an abolition movement which creates its own shape. Uh, on the good side of that, you can say that women's history has in fact effectively reshaped notions like liberalism, for example, or nation, in which uh, the significance of women's history has been felt. Now, I want to make it clear here that I'm, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not at all sure that this is a bad thing. In fact, I think we have learned an awful lot. We have reshaped American history by doing this. And that, the, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the largest influence on the transformation of American uh, history within the last uh, three decades has been that of women's history. All I'm suggesting here is that in doing that, in achieving that, there has been a loss. And the loss is the result of what I see as political repression. That I wonder what would have happened had we been able to uh, maintain the strength of that early women's history and at the same time use it to reshape instead of giving up the strength of that early women's history to reshape. That's the question.